So how's everyone doing today? Cool, welcome. That was uh, very unenthusiastic, but I'll forgive you. It's 3 o'clock on a Friday. It's close to, uh, well, I won't say what time I, I tend to say because I'm being recorded, uh, and it's got an F-bomb in it. But uh, actually, it's got another bad word in it, too. So anyhow, um, so welcome, everyone, uh, to Understanding Probabilistic Data Structures with 112,092 UFO Sightings. My name is Guy Royce. I'm a developer advocate at Redis. Uh, there's really not much on this slide that matters. Uh, there's something on there that will matter to you. There's something that matters to me. And there's something that matters to my boss. Any guess which thing matters to my boss? That, uh, come on, Pointer, get over there. That Redis logo right there. <laughs> uh, my job is to go out and say, hey, Redis is cool, and it does things like, that you might not be aware of. How many here have used Redis before? A lot of you. Um, how many have used it for something other than a cache? More than all, usual. Uh, uh, most people, it's a cache. It's got get and set. Well, I'm going to talk about today uh, probabilistic data structures, which is a thing that Redis does as well. I'm going to talk about the data structures really more than the Redis, but I'll show you how to do it in Redis as well. Uh, so that's the part that matters to my boss. Uh, the part that matters to me is uh, are those social media links there. Well, maybe the Twitter account doesn't matter as much as it used to, but, <laughs> uh, but you know. Kind of matters to me a little bit, I guess. But anyhow, uh, I sort of judge my value as a human based on how many people follow me on social media. And so uh, please do me a favor and give me a follow. Uh, the part that matters to you, the important part, is that github.com slash Guy Royce URL. Uh, there's lots of code and repositories. All my, all my talks are archived out there. So if you want to go check stuff out afterwards and play with this, uh, that is a good place to go. I will point out that, yes, I do have a domain name of guy.dev. Yeah, which uh, I think is probably the most badass thing that I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> For the low, low price of $180 a month, a year, not a month, a month. Well, that'd be a lot, wouldn't it? $180 US a year. So, um, But yeah, so 112,092. This is kind of a surprising number. It's a surprisingly large number. It's a surprisingly precise number. Uh, this is the number of UFO sightings I have in this wonderful data set. Uh, called uh, that I, I, I pulled off the internet. 112,092 UFO sightings in North America from about 1950 to about five-ish years ago. Uh, this data is glorious and wonderful. I've got it, I got it off, off this website called data.world, uh, and it was screen scraped from the National UFO Research Center um, by this wonderful user of that website named Tim Renner. And he scrapes uh, UFO uh, sightings from their, uh, their website, made a big CSV file with 112,092 lines in it, oh, 93 count in the header. And um, he, he, that's what he does. He likes weird data. He scrapes the stuff and he does data science against it. He did it with Bigfoot sightings. He did it with UFO sightings. He did it with haunted places. He even did it with Dogman sightings. I didn't even know Dogman was a thing. I, I, I guess he's a dog man. <laughs> and um, what he likes to do with them is do data science and, and do interesting uh, discoveries. He used the Bigfoot sighting data to try and figure out where Bigfoot tends to be found. And he did some clustering on it to find out geographically where it's at. And he got these unusual structures, these clumps of Bigfoot sightings. And then he realized that you could find Bigfoot in the woods. <laughs> um, because those sites corresponded to densely, pot, densely forested areas. Uh, he did a bunch of uh, things to figure out where the UFO sightings tended to happen. And he guessed where UFO sightings tended to happen the most often. Within 50 miles of US Air Force bases. Shocking, right? <laughs> the number one day for UFO sightings in this data set, uh, it, it's, all, it's in North America, mind you. Uh, July 4th, Independence Day. You know, with all the fireworks? Dad, is that a firework? Uh, no, son, that's a UFO. Um, the second place, by the way, was uh, New Year's Eve. So, um, so yeah, he does important, important work. And so he has made all these ridiculous talks that I do possible because he screen scrapes some silly sites to do some silly data science. And so now I'm going to use this data to show, teach you about probabilistic data structures. Uh, the data's got, um, it, it's not particularly brilliant. Uh, you've got a summary. Uh, it's just text describing the UFO sighting briefly. Uh, three saucer-shaped ships. 
easy for me to say. Uh, high in the sky, metallic but no shine, rather dull gray, they hovered overhead in a V formation. Yep, sounds like a UFO sighting. We've got the city and state that it happened in in the US. So this one happened in Salem, Oregon. The date and time in ISO 8601 format. So uh, this happened in uh, September the 15th of uh, 1950. Uh, the shape of the UFO sighting, uh, some, uh, there's a whole bunch of shapes that they can be in, and disc is one of them, and triangle is another, and, and light apparently is a shape uh, that they use to classify UFO sightings. You've got your duration, which is just this little thing expressed for humans. It's not a precise minute seconds. It's just 15 minutes or about 20 minutes, that sort of thing. The link to the site at the newfork.org, uh, where you can read the report. The full text of the sighting, um, by the, uh, the, the eyewitness account, and a latitude and longitude of the city where it happened. So this is fun data. You can do all kinds of fun stuff like with this. So this is the data we're gonna use to explore probabilistic data structures. Um, but what the heck's probabilistic data structure? Has anyone here ever used or heard of a probabilistic data structure before? Show hands. Exactly, right? I did a survey to find out on Twitter this is very scientific, uh, 119 people voted. And I asked, uh, who all, have you heard of probabilistic data structures? And I was doing this when I was putting together this talk because I wanted to get a feel for just how well known they were. Uh, about 60%, three out of five had never heard of them at all. So you're in good company. Uh, about a fifth of them had heard the term. I suspect most of them had heard that term in the question. We're sometimes literally minded, aren't we? 10% uh, roughly knew what they were, and 10% had used them. So we're looking at like one out of five people had any idea what a probabilistic data structure was, and only half of them had used it. So if you don't know what one is, you're in the right place, you're in the right company, this is pretty normal. So you're ignorant, that's great. Right? <laughs> that's why you're here. Um, and so, to define what a probabilistic data structure is, I'm gonna to go to their evil opposite, their, their evil twin, deterministic data structures. Now, you all know what deterministic data structures are. You may not have called them this, but you, you've used these before. These are the linked lists and the sets and the arrays and the hash tables and the graphs and the trees and the queues and, and all those structures that we use all the time. Probably the one you've used the most is hash table and list because almost every language has some variation of, of that. Um, and they're called deterministic data structures because, well, because they do what you tell them to. If I put something into a list, I know that when I ask for it, it will be there. I, think I can get it back out. If I put something in a hash table, I know that it will be there. If I delete it, it will be gone. That's what it makes it deterministic. It does what you would expect. Uh, I'm gonna look at hash tables in particular and the reason I'm gonna do that is because uh, A, not all of you have taken computer science courses. I, I hadn't. B, uh, the ideas behind a hash table are actually uh, very useful for understanding probabilistic data structures because they take advantage of hashing algorithms quite a bit as well. And so uh, we've all used a hash table, right? We might not know that we've used a hash table. If we took computer science and data structures class, we wrote a hash table. Um, but it's our basic key value pair. If you're, say, a .NET developer, which I suspect is a good majority of the room, we call these dictionaries. If uh, you're a Python developer, it's dictionaries. If you're a Java developer, uh, you have my sympathy. And uh, we would call these uh, hash maps. And if you're a JavaScript developer like me, um, this is pretty much everything. Everything's just a, a hash table in JavaScript. And it's just your basic key value pair, right? You, you, know, you put a key in and say, I want my city, and then it's got a value associated with it, and this key is associated with another value. We've used these. But why are they called hash tables? Well, because they use a hashing function. And we've all heard of hashing functions probably as well, uh, but lots of times we're thinking of them in terms of cryptographic hashes. So uh, you know, I need to create a hash of my, uh, my blockchain, blah, 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 NFTs, something, something, right? Uh, you use a, like a SHA-256 to encode something and get a, a cryptographically secure hash. Um, but all a hashing function does is it takes data and turns it into a number. 
It can take a little bit of data. It can take a lot of data. Some hashing functions require some sort of seed or salt. Um, here, I'm, I'm showing here, you've got on the left some data here and a, a randomly generated seed. And if you put that data with that seed, you will always get this number on the right out. Uh, this data up here is the bytes making up the name Scully in UTF-8. And uh, that's sort of what hashing functions do. They, they turn a pile of data into a number of a fixed width. And then we can consistently always get that number when we run that data through there. So it's deterministic. And this is useful if you want to get a signature without having to store the entire document. You, there used to be way back in the day you would store all your passwords this way and like your Etsy password file or whatever it was, and I think it was using MD5 at the time. But. And so a hash table then uses these by creating a, uh, an array of linked lists. So on, on the right here, we've got an array. I've got 10 items in that array. Each, uh, of, each of those items in the array is a linked list. And when we want to add a value to the hash table, we take the key that we want to use, so city. We run it through a hashing function, get out a number. We m get the modulus of that number equal to our index, how wide our index is. So we've got 10 items, so we have modulus at 10, and that gives us an index for us to put that value into. So when we add city, we want to add this Salem, the value Salem to the city property on a hash table, we go through that process and shove it in there. And we add that Salem to that linked list. That's how we add to a hash table. We can add another thing. Here we've added the state of Oregon. And so we hash state, we get the number four. And so when we hash city, we got the number one. And so we put Oregon in position four, et cetera, et cetera. Occasionally, you will get a collision. Uh, there's only 10 items here. We will probably want to put more than 10 things in our hash table. And so this is why these buckets are linked lists. This is why this is an array of linked lists. So what we do is we just add it to the next item in the linked list, and then we walk that linked list to find it. So if we read from this hash table, if we want to read the city, uh, we hash the city, get the index, go to the linked list, walk that linked list until we find the city, and then we return the value. Make sense? For those who, I did this really fast. And so those who've taken data structures class are like, yeah, 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 this is review. And then the rest of you are like, oh, I kind of get it. Don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> uh, the key thing is, is that we're uh, hashing these key names and we're hashing data and then we're using that as an index. That's a property you'll see over and over in the probabilistic data structures. So when we pick our deterministic data structures, we, uh, we're often making trade-offs between the time complexity of that data structure and the space complexity of that data structure. So if you, uh, for example, want to use a linked list, linked lists are great because they're very compact. Uh, they store, they use exactly how much memory they need to use, no more, no less. However, if you want to find something in a linked list, you have to walk that linked list to find it. And so they have good space complexity, but they have bad time complexity. Their uh, time complexity is O of n, for reads and is O of one uh, to update. Whereas uh, something like a hash table tends to have, you've got this array and it's got empty pointers that aren't pointing to anything. And so it's got a little bit of wasted space, but finding things in a hash table is an O of one operation. And so the lookups are fast, uh, but it wastes a little bit of space. Whereas an array uh, or a, a linked list, the lookups are slow, but it's very compact. Um, and so we make these sorts of trade-offs when we pick our data structures all the time. Um, but it's not the only trade-off we're making because there's capabilities in these data structures as well. So like the array list is actually really quick to add things to. So if I want to add something to the tail of a linked list, it's very fast, it's very easy. Uh, if I use an array, arrays uh, have O of one for modifying values. Uh, they're fixed size, so they just take up what they take. But if you need to resize them, that's difficult. And so we don't just choose time and space. We also are choosing the capabilities of these data structures. Like some data structures work well for certain scenarios, and others work well for other things that I want to do. And, um, it's, but it's not just time and space. There's another option we can have when we're looking at our data structures of ways that we can uh, 
another trade-off we can make other than just size and speed, and that's accuracy. So a probabilistic data structure is a data structure that's making a compromise against accuracy. Uh, we are saying, I want something that's really small and really fast, but that lies to me sometimes. That sounds crazy, right? Why would I want my data structures to lie to me? Well, because I need to count really big numbers, maybe. Or, um, well, basically, because you, you need a scale and the accuracy just doesn't matter. Let's say uh, you're a video streaming service or video hosting service whose name ends in tube. And you, uh, you want to count how many unique visitors, unique users have watched a video. How, how would you solve that with a deterministic data structure? You would have to put all the usernames in a set. Oh, what if it has a million views? A million unique users viewing it, or 10 million, or 100 million? What if it's Gangnam style? And it's got like, how many, it had like a billion views or something like that? They weren't all unique, but I know I at least watched it four times. <laughs> Well, that structure's not gonna work, but you don't need to know that you had exactly 10,917,305 views. You could be off by a couple percentage points and it's still gonna be perfectly usable because that exact count isn't really the important part. This is the kind of trade-off you're making when you're making an accuracy trade-off. And so that's the idea behind a probabilistic data structure. I'll get something that's less accurate uh, but I can get a couple of order of magnitudes in time and space savings. It's a good trade-off. And this is a trade-off that you've made before, even if you haven't used probabilistic data structures. Uh, this is a, a JPEG of, uh, of the Devil's Tower in Wyoming, in the Badlands, in the US. Uh, those of you who are old enough to uh, remember this scene from, uh, with Richard Dreyfuss and mashed potatoes may remember why I pick, no, why I picked this image. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool place. And it, and it was very prominent in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And uh, this pixel right up here, that one right there, the blue one, you see it? Yeah. It's actually the wrong color. Why? Well, because JPEGs are lossy. That's, that's how they compress them. And they make them smaller. And then in the process of making them smaller, we lose a little bit of the data. We lose a, bit, a little bit of fidelity, a little bit of accuracy in the original image but it still just looks like a blue sky. And so probabilistic, probabilistic data structures are a little bit lossy, but good enough. That's, that's when you use them. That's when they make sense. A lot of probabilistic data structures can be thought of as uh, unusual sets with uh, limited capabilities. And when I say sets, I mean the Venn diagram things, right? You can get the union and the intersection and the uh, difference and Test for membership and cardinality and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the ones I'm going to talk to today are all about, uh, all can be thought of as sets with limited capabilities. You can test a set for membership. So here we have a set of star, square, circle, and triangle. These are totally not all the shapes in the Redis logo. And the question is, is the square in the set? Well, yes, yes it is. Is the... Uh, Pentagon in the set? No, it's in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so that's a question of membership. Is this thing in the set or not? You can have a probabilistic data structure that's optimized for cardinality, for counting. Uh, how many unique things are in a set? This would be the fill in the blank tube example I gave earlier. Uh, I've added a bunch of things to the set. Uh, there are only unique items in the set. How many unique items are there in the set? So we've got a star, a square, a circle, a triangle. There are four items in the set, so it's a cardinality of four. I could have a probability data probabilistic data structure that is good at telling me the frequency of items in a set within a certain degree of accuracy. And this is where the set analogy breaks in ever so slightly, because I know that sets technically only have unique members, and I'm saying here that it has five stars, four squares, six circles, and three triangles. Um, but the idea is that there's a numeric value associated with each entry in the set and it increments as you add items, add duplicated items to it. And this can count at the frequency. And so you can get an idea of, well, how many squares are there in the set? Or how many, 
uh, how many circles are there in the set. And if you can uh, do frequency, you can also do uh, ranking. And this is similar in the idea that you can say, well, give me the top so many things in the set, or this item, what's its position in the set? Uh, and you can do that probabilistically without necessarily knowing the count. So frequency is about knowing the counts of things, probabilistically. Ranking is about knowing the order of things. And the counting, we, we, we don't have accurate counts, but we know the order. So these are things you can do with these sets. Um, you can also compare prob uh, sets of data. Uh, we're gonna look at uh, similarity later on uh, when we look at minhash. And we can say uh, how much a set is like another set. And can I just say I absolutely love this photo. It's probably my favorite photo in the entire uh, set of random photos here. So uh, there are a lot of choices of probabilistic data structures. I just kind of went out to Google and found a collection of them out there and, and, uh, and to, to, to populate a list here and looked into what the basic ones are. But uh, there's a lot of options out there. Uh, we've got this little list here. Uh, the ones that are highlighted in blue are the ones we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to talk about bloom filters, heavy keepers, and minhash. Uh, the ones in gray we won't be talking about. Uh, the ones with the little um, red cross dagger thing right up here, like that thing right there, uh, those are part of Redis stack, which is Redis with a bunch of extra data structures. Um, I'll mention that in the next slide. And then the one with the little double dagger here, uh, hyperlog log, is part of uh, vanilla uh, Redis. So bloom filters and cuckoo filters, uh, I'll let you check for membership. Uh, hyperlog log uh, counts things, it does cardinality. Uh, hyperlog log is actually particularly cool because it's 12 kilobytes and you can count the number of unique atoms in the universe with it, which is kind of neat. And uh, within like a, I think a 97 point, there's like a fixed accuracy for it. Uh, count sketch and count min sketch are about getting the frequency of things. Uh, Q digest and T digest. I haven't looked at Q digest that closely. T digest is, is like a probabilistic time series. And so it can fill in, it, it can interpolate values that might be missing. Uh, heavy keeper is uh, part of top K, which we'll look at later. It's all about um, tracking uh, how big a, a data coming in and f how it flows over time. So you can use it to find things like uh, trending topics or like which IP addresses are uh, engage in a denial of service attack against my, uh, my server, that sort of thing. And then minhash and simhash uh, will do similarity where you can do, um, you can do like a document similarity comparison. And I'm, I'm I think minhash was created by Google back in the 90s, maybe early 2000s, I can't remember. And they were using it to determine whether they should crawl a page again or not if it changed enough. So we're gonna look at three of these. Um, the two that have Redis capability, I'll, I'll go ahead and demo some Redis stuff with them. Uh, for minhash, it's not part of Redis, it's just kind of cool, so I won't demo that. But um, these uh, probabilistic data structures are available as part of Redis stack. Redis stack is the Redis that you know and love with uh, extra capabilities, uh, modules that are plugged into Extendit, um, and so they add new data types and new commands. Uh, there's a JSON one to do JSON data types. Uh, Search, they'll let you search those JSON. Redis Graph, which is uh, a graph database in a key. Uh, Redis Time Series, which stores time series database in a Redis key. And the one we're gonna talk about today a bit is Redis Bloom, which adds probabilistic data structures to Redis. You can get Redis, uh, Redis Stack at redis.io. It's honestly easier to Google Redis Stack than it is to type that in. That's what I always do. <laughs> so, advertisement done. Let's, uh, let's take a look at Bloom Filter. And hopefully I have enough time to get through all these. Uh, so a Bloom Filter tests for membership. It can say no and probably. So I can add all kinds of things to a Bloom Filter. And then, and then I can say, is this thing in the Bloom Filter? And it will say, no, it is not. Or, yeah, it probably is. Uh, bloom filters are fast, they're really fast, everything's O of one, and uh, they are of a fixed size when you create them. So they don't grow at all. So I guess they have a size complexity equal to O of one as well. And uh, you would use a bloom filter to um, 
Uh, it's two big use cases for bloom filters that I can think of, uh, that I, get, I thought of when I was rehearsing this an hour ago. Um, one is um, if you wanted to get unique usernames for a website. Let's say you've got a website with a lot of users. Uh, maybe, maybe something like Twitter or something, I don't know. And you want to see if that username is taken. Well, you can't exactly do select star from users where username equals username I'd like to use. That's not going to work with you know, tens or hundreds of millions of users. But you could shove all the usernames into a Bloom filter and then ask the Bloom filter, is this username used yet or not? And it, if it says no, then you're good to go. You use it. If it says maybe, then you just don't let anyone have that username. And now you've got a, a nice, fast way to determine whether a username can be used or not. Uh, you can also use this for data deduplication. If you've got, say, uh, imagine a file full, full of you know, thousands of documents, you could run them all into the Bloom filter. And if it says, uh, I haven't seen this before, then um, if, if it says no when you add it, I have not seen this before, then you can say, this one's good. If I have seen this before, then um, I should look at it and see if it's a duplicate or not. So you can use it to dedupe data as well. A bloom filter's got two main parts. It's got some hash functions with their corresponding seeds. Again, these are not cryptographic hashes. These are probably murmur filters or something like that. And it's got a, a bit array of a fixed width. When I add something to a bloom filter, for example, I want to see whether I've heard this uh, UFO sighting before or not. Uh, Megatron in the bushes. This is a great story about these, uh, I'm going to say kids, but I, they were probably in their 20s, um, who were driving along the highway, I, I think in New Mexico. And it's, it's in the data set. I actually pulled these out of the data set. Um, and uh, they just, just pulled off to the side of the road because they needed to take care of an important and necessary bodily function. Probably because they had too much beer to drink. <laughs> and uh, and they're, they're going back behind one of the, uh, the sagebrush there, and they hear a weird sound. They hear like the, a transformer transforming. They hear Megatron in the bushes, and he, he goes like And they, they freak out, and they hop in their car, and they take off, and then lights chase them from behind the mountains for 60 miles, and uh, I'm sure they totally weren't high. <laughs> uh, these sightings are so much fun to go looking through. I can't recommend it enough. Anyhow, so we want to see if we've seen this one before. So we're going to add it to the bloom filter because we, we've just received it, and we can check later to see if we've seen it. So uh, we add it there. We take the data, and we run it through our hashing functions, and we get a number because that's what hashing functions do. We modulus that number with the width of our bloom filter, which in this case is 10 because it fits on the screen. And then everywhere we have... We now have indexes in the other array, and we set them to 1. So we set it 0, 5, and 6 are now set to 1. We've added something to the bloom filter. The data is gone. It's all hashed away. But we, ha we have the, like, the fingerprints of the data in the bloom filter. Now if we want to say, have we seen Megatron in the bushes before? We go through that same process. We get the same indices. And then we look and say, are these all 1s? If they're all 1s, then probably. If there's a zero in there, we've definitely not seen it, because otherwise, that would have been set. I'm going to add another one. I seen a UFO when I was about 13 years old. Uh, the Yelly case was in the original data file. So, this actually happened in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio, which is was totally random. I just saw, honestly, I was just scrolling through the list of UFO sightings, and I saw the one in all uppercase, and then it got my attention. And so I put it in the slide. But then I found out they were in Columbus, and that was extra funny. Uh, so in this case, we run this through the same process. We get different indices, but one of them's the same. Uh, I've circled it up there in, in green, right there. And so we set positions 1 and 2 to 1, where they were 0 before. And 6, we don't do anything to, because it's already set to 1. So we've added another item. Now, if we go and read uh, this, we get all ones back. If we go and read uh, Megatron in the bushes, we get all ones back. And so the bloom filter is still telling us correct things. We've got a set in 10 bits uh, that's telling us, this, I've seen this before, I've seen this before. Now, where it starts to break down is when you get collision. This is where it gets probabilistic. 
So uh, we've added another uh, sighting here, Investigators for the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. I just happen to know that's what that stands for. Observe a glowing green-blue sphere. And this one completely intersects with where there are ones already. Some of those ones are from uh, Megatron in the bushes. Some of those ones are from uh, I seen a UFO. Uh, but this doesn't change the state of the bloom filter. So if we add it and then query it and say, have you seen this one before? The bloom filter is going to say probably. If we don't add it and ask the bloom filter, have you seen this one before? It's going to say probably. And so whether we've seen this or not is kind of, well, it's probabilistic. Uh, if we had done this in other orders, it would change the nature of this because it's probabilistic. And so um, this is pretty much how a bloom filter works. Is that, is that resonating with everyone? Any questions so far? You're, yeah. Is there a trade off between using, say, any wet one hash function versus some greater number of hash functions? That's a fantastic. Could you still work with one hash function? But I guess it's worse in some way. Yeah, that's actually a fantastic question. It was a point I meant to make and forgot, so thank you. Uh, he's a plant. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, yeah, that, that's actually the trade off. So, um, the more hashing functions you have, the less impactful a collision will be because you're not going to get 100% overlap. You're less likely to get 100% overlap on that collision. Um, but then the wider you need to make your bit array. So the more hashing functions you have, the wider you want your bit array, the smaller your bit array, the fewer hashing functions you need, but then the impact of that collision is more significant. Uh, there's actually a formula for figuring out the optimal thing for this. Just use this easy math. <laughs> I didn't take a lot of math in school, so I actually wouldn't know how to do this, but it's not as awful as it looks. What you can do if you want to do this manually is you can just uh, pick, um, you know how many items you want to store in your bloom filter. By the way, it's worth mentioning here, if you, if you look here, if you keep adding things to this, eventually this will fill up, and it will be all ones, and then it will be full of lies. <laughs> it, it will always just tell you, it's like, yeah, that's probably in there. Yeah, that's probably in there. It's, it's, it's like an American. It just always says, yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Yeah, so if you have more hash functions, you've got to have more bits to compensate for it, or its capacity for the total number of items you want to store is greatly diminished. Yeah. How full should it be before you say it's full? Well, that's what this calculation is for, actually. Um, uh, in Redis, we actually will keep track of it and see if it gets too full, and then we'll create another one, and another one, and another one, and then it impacts the performance because then you have a, nut, a second bloom filter check, uh, but, that, you know, but it keeps it from it being a problem. Uh, if you're coding one of these up yourself, uh, you just need to, well, you just use this math here. So what you do is you pick like a number of items, like, ah, I think I need to store a billion things in my bloom filter, or a hundred things, whatever. And, um, and then you guess at a number of bits. And then you compute the number of hashes for k down here using the bottom formula. And uh, that will give you a, uh, and then you use that to solve for p to give you a false positivity rate. And then you say, is that good enough or not? And then you adjust. So that's how you can do it if you just want to use pen and paper and do it the hard way. There's websites that will calculate this for you, which is the better way. Um, and. Um, if we use Redis, it will just, like I said, take care of it. I'm going to do a quick demo here with Redis, just to show that this stuff is real. OK, here's Redis. I'm going to go here. I'm using a tool called Redis Insight. So uh, I'm going to say BF, that's for bloom filter, dot add. Or no, I'm going to set one up, reserve. And then I want to give it a key. We'll call it bloom, because I have imagination. And then we'll set an acceptable error rate. So I'm going to go with 0 0.001. So I want 1 in 1,000, so 99.9% .9 accuracy. And then I need to say how many items. Let's add, let's say this is going to be for 1,000 items. I now have a bloom filter. Redis said OK. <laughs> and so I can do bf.add bloom. And then I can add, uh, what should, let's just do foobar baz. Now we'll do Alpha Bravo Charlie. That feels more UFO-y. <laughs> so we'll do Bravo. And then let's 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 do a uh, 
a check then. So once we've added things, we can say bf.exists bloom, and if we put in alpha, we get back a one down here saying that, hey, that does exist. If we do something that doesn't exist, we get back, it should be a zero. This thing renders zeros as nil. So if we go down to here, we can see the same thing. Exists bloom Charlie. There, integer zero. So that's a super quick Redis demo of using a bloom filter in Redis. Uh, I have a sam sample code for a bloom filter uh, out in the GitHub repo for this, this talk. Uh, there's not a lot, they're actually really easy to code up. I mean, you literally have, I, I did it in JavaScript, so it's inefficient. And I actually literally use an array of Booleans, which is like the worst way you could possibly do this. <laughs> but, but it was just to show how it worked, so. Let's get this back up. Okay, and this is just showing you the syntax I just showed you. It's not complicated. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So all that was doing was using that uh, calculation uh, that was here. But yeah, it, it will over time. And, and so it's at a particular capacity or below on average, it's gonna be that accurate, but it's not, it's not an absolute thing. But all, all Redis is doing behind the scenes there is it takes that error rate and then uses, and plugs it into here and, figure, and does the algebra. Let's see. Can I? So balloon filters are cool. Uh, we're gonna talk about minhash next. Uh, minhash is uh, used to determine how similar documents are um, using set similarity. Uh, so set similarity itself is something I want to talk about before I talk about turning documents into sets and before I talk about getting the similarity of documents. And so you can get the similarity of any two sets of data using a simple calculation called the Jacquard similarity. Uh, all you're doing here is you're taking uh, the cardinality of the intersection that'd be how many things are in the intersection, and dividing it by how many things are in the union, or divided by the total number of things. So here I've got uh, Scalder and Molly, face-swapped uh, friends from uh, the X-Files, uh, and uh, we have states in the United States in which they've seen UFOs. Scalder has seen them in uh, California, Nevada, Oregon, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Ohio. Molly has seen them in Florida, Kansas, South Carolina, West by God, Virginia, New Mexico and Ohio. Uh, the intersection is New Mexico and Ohio, Area 51, Hangar 18, sounds legit. And so there's two in the intersection, there's 10 total. These sets are 20% similar. That's it, basic math. Um, but we can't apply this to documents easily. Like how could we do this with a document? Can we take all the words of a document and just make a set of all the words in one document and all the, a set of all the words in another document. And their similarity is gonna be really high because they're both written in English. <laughs> and so that's not gonna tell us anything to let us compare documents. And so uh, to turn documents into sets so that we can see how similar they are and then to do it probabilistically after that, um, we need to do a process called shingling. Shingling takes trigrams, sets of three words, overlapping and makes a set out of those. So here we have we notice two, notice two R, two R left, and so on until we get a set of all the trigrams, the overlapping trigrams in that document. So we notice to our left, further off in the mountains, a bright glow. This is from Megatron in the bushes. And so if we do this to documents, we can now compare these sets of trigrams and see how similar they are, and those will give us an actual meaningful similarity with our documents. And so here we're doing that. We've got Skelter's report and Molly's report, both going to Skinner to uh, find out, uh, you know, how, you know, compare the results of what they found in the field. And if we do uh, the Jacquard similarity calculation on these sets, 
Uh, we get an intersection of seven, a union of 11, and these have a jacquard similarity of 63.63 repeating percent. So this is more useful. But this has a problem too. Uh, any, any guess what it is? <laughs> Performance. <laughs> uh, you are storing a lot of strings. These, uh, these um, sets are bigger than the documents were originally. And, uh, and comparing all these sets together is really intensive. And so uh, Google came up with a better way to do this uh, using a min hash. So the min hash is calculated, once again, using a hashing function with a seed. And we take every single trigram in the report there, so all these here going down, are fed through a hashing function up here and across to create a set of numbers for each trigram. So number 325 in this first set here, right there, is we notice two. 489 is notice 2R, all the way down to 3812, which is the mountains A. And then we do this for each hash. And so we end up with a set of numbers for each hash function for all the trigrams. That we then take, for each of those sets, the smallest value in each one, which is why it's called min hash. And so the minimum hash for each hash function for the set of trigrams in the document. And we end up with, and since we use three hashing functions, we end up with three numbers, 233, 143, and 102. This is much smaller and tidier than, um, and easier to work with than the big, giant bunch of text. We can do the same thing for, mol for Molly's minhash and calculate a similar value. And then we can take these sets and they act like document signatures. And we can compare them using Jacquard similarity and get a number. Now, this number is 50% similar. And that's mostly because I picked three things. I have three hashing functions. You probably want to use more. Um, but this will show you how, much, how similar something is probabilistically. It's not as accurate as you're going to get uh, by actually counting the trigrams. Uh, but it would give you a good feel for how similar these are. You could use this for detecting plagiarism uh, and saying, well, these are, have a high similarity. Uh, you could use this um, for doing, web, should I bother to recrawl this web page? Because has it changed enough for me to justify re-indexing it? Um, and the nice thing is, is that you, can just, you don't have to store the document that you use to generate your min hash. You can just store the min hash and then you go to another document and generate another min hash that using the same seeds and compare them. And so you don't, you, you can, you know, if you're Google, you don't have to store the entire internet to, in, to know whether you've indexed the page or not. So min hashes are kind of neat. Uh, I actually ran into someone at a conference uh, late last year who said, oh, we were doing this other thing where we were just picking random parts of the document to see if they'd changed or not. He's like, I should probably be using this. <laughs> Wow, that's the first time anyone's ever actually needed this. <laughs> it's kind of neat, but it's a little, you know, esoteric. Uh, I used to work for an insurance company, and you know, you don't really need to do this when you're working in an insurance company, right? Uh, but it's it's still pretty cool stuff. So that's uh, MinHash. I don't have a demo for MinHash. I do have an implementation uh, out of my GitHub repo that you can go check out. Uh, last but certainly not least, we've got Top K, which is um, I say it's actually a heavy keeper. It's called Top K in Redis, uh, but it's using a, a data structure called a heavy keeper combined with a min heap. And uh, what Top K does is it ranks items. And so, and, and, it, and it, it, it stores them in a way that can erode. So you could use this for, uh, I mentioned this earlier, for uh, IP addresses that are hitting your server. So you, you, know, you get the top five most common, common IP addresses that are hitting my server. And those are gonna change over time as you know, someone stops hitting my server with that IP address, it needs to fall down the ranks as newer ones come in. Or trending topics, where trending topics are coming in, uh, different hashtags. And over time, they get mentioned less and less, and so they drop down through the ranks and more current topics uh, bubble up. And so uh, Top K is great for this. I already mentioned it, it's a min heap and a heavy keeper. I'm not gonna go into how a min heap works. Uh, but we'll talk about a heavy keeper. A heavy keeper, this is probably the most complicated of the data structures I've talked about so far. I think it's probably the most complicated in the ones that Redis offers in Redis Bloom. Um, but a heavy keeper has, once again, unsurprisingly, 
a bunch of hash functions with seeds. Right? Right over here. So we've got three, because three fits on the screen. And then um, the, uh, the actual structure that stores all the data is a, um, an array, uh, an array of um, just two values, uh, the, the bu a bu array of buckets, I guess we could say. And that bucket has a, hash, a place for a hash value and a count. So it's just got two integers. And we have a number of these arrays equal to the number of hashing functions. And when we create a new one, everything is empty. So the hash is null or zero, the count is zero, and the, uh, the hash functions have uh, newly created seeds. And this is going to count how often whatever you've added to it is in there. It will count and it will keep incrementing those counts, but things can come in and erode those counts and reduce them. And so this will always give you the, the correct number or less. So this, this is actually kind of a bad counting algorithm, but that's not what it's for. It's there to support ranking. And so we want older stuff to get eroded. I'll, I'll show you how it works and this will make a little more sense. So we're gonna put uh, words that are used to describe the shapes of UFOs into here. And so uh, object is a popular description of a shape of a UFO, perhaps the least useful one. I saw an object in the sky. What was its shape? It was an object. <laughs> and so uh, we're gonna add the word object, we put it into those hashing functions, and we get a hash value out. We modulus that with the width of our buckets, of that array, we get an index, here we get two, one, and two. And then we make a decision. We look at the position in the index. And if there is a zero, which all of us have for the count, and the hash is not populated if it's null, then we can claim ownership of it. And so the word object with a hash value of 4062, or 5062, can claim spot two in that array. And so it puts its value in there, it increments the count from zero to one. And we do that with all of those. <clears throat> if we're adding something and there's something there already, then we make another decision. We, we come in and we add object a second time. And we look there and say, well, is the hash value that I stored in this bucket the same as the hash value I just generated? Yes? Okay, well, that's mine. Increment the count. So now we've added object to here twice, and so it reflects two, or reflects that count. When we go to read this, all we do is uh, we go through the same process. We give it the word object, it creates the hashes, it finds the indices, and it looks and says, find all the, uh, the rows where the hash matches the hash, and then give me the biggest number. So here, object matches all three of those, all right, over here, and they all have a two, so the count is two. Let's add something else to it. So we add the word light, also a popular UFO shape. And this goes through here and gives us uh, different hash values for the different hash functions and uh, gives us different indices for the first two rows. So in row number one, uh, it finds an unclaimed spot and so it claims and increments it by one. Row two finds an unclaimed spot, increments it by one. But in row three, there's something there already and the hash numbers, the hash values don't match. So what happens? Does it take it over? Well, what happens is it's gonna decrement, maybe. So um, we will do some math to determine a probability as to whether we will reduce that count by one without changing the, the hash. If we reduce it to zero, we've got a new empty slot that someone might claim later. And so uh, the way we calculate that is, uh, taking B, which is a magic number that we use when we create our data structure, and the count, uh, to the power of negative the count, so in our case, negative two. Uh, B needs to be a number that's greater than one, but really close to one. So I picked 1.05, you can do 1.01, whatever, whatever you want. Uh, the bigger that number, uh, the, more, the, the more easily things will decay. I think, I may, actually I may have just said that backwards. 
don't, don't take that to the bank. <laughs> um, so here we, we got a magic number of 1.05 to the power of negative two. It gives us a 90.7% chance of it being decayed. If there was a lot of things in there, let's say we had 10,000 as our count, 1.05 to the power of negative 10,000 is a very small number. And so the likelihood of it decaying would be really low. But it would decay over time. And so uh, we're going to say that 90.7 might as well be 100%, and we're going to go ahead and decay this. What this means is that the counts can be eroded over time. And this is why it works for like a trending topic, because as I add topics into here, uh, as topics are not mentioned anymore, they slowly get eroded away over time, and then the new ones come in and start replacing them. So it keeps the heavy things and then, and then throws away the, the little things, and that's, that's why it's called a heavy keeper. So uh, here, light decay has occurred. Light has not claimed that position. It's still associated with objects, but we can query it and still get accurate numbers. So let's query uh, the word light, and uh, we find the count for light. It matches in two rows. In the third row, we don't have a match. And so we take the largest number there. That's a one. So we've added light to it one time, which is correct. For object, uh, we have uh, a match on all three of them, but we have different numbers. We've got two, two, and one now. Two is the largest, so we return the two. And so its count is still accurate. And whenever this happens, whenever we add something to it, we update a min heap, which is the thing that actually stores the strings that we're caring about, the IP addresses or the uh, uh, whatever, whatever the value is that we're trying to get the top K of. And so the min heap is updated and resorted each time. And so if we want to say, just give me the top five items, then it just goes and interrogates the min heap. We want to get the counts, then we can use the heavy keeper. Um, there's some Redis commands around this. You can call top k dot reserve. I'm going to skip this here. Um, top k dot reserve lets you set one up and say, I want to keep track of three things, 100 wide, five hashing functions. And the decay rate there is the, in, the reciprocal of the one I used in my example. Uh, you can add things. It does what you think it does. You can query things, which will say, is it in the top k? And it'll say yes or no. You can count. That will give the count from the heavy keeper. It's almost always wrong. And you can do a list to get the things that are in the heap. So I have built a silly thing that uses this in Redis. And uh, I've got this data set that I mentioned earlier with all these probabilistic data structures in it. It is right here, newforkreports.csv. Watch it crash. There, there we go. Um, yeah. 112,101. I must have something wrong. Maybe I got my number wrong in my presentation. Um, so those are all, all the sightings. These are out here in a zip file in the Git repo, actually. And I've got two little uh, Python programs. One um, reads through all these, uh, C these CSV files, pulls out the uh, shapes, most commonly used shapes, and the most commonly, or the shapes that are in here in the CSV and the uh, summary, and then parses them out and adds them to a uh, heavy keeper. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the code because I'm getting a little short on time, uh, but you can go check it out later if you like. Uh, this basically is using uh, NLTK to pull out stop words, so the top 10 words aren't A and the or, that kind of stuff, so you get more interesting words. And then uh, I got, and it just, and it uses uh, uh, pandas to do a lot of the uh, CSV parsing. So, and then I've got app.py, which is just a simple little Flask app, which exposes some endpoints to, uh, ex uh, to return uh, what the top 10 shapes and the top 10 words are with corresponding counts. So it's not complicated code. You can go check it out and see how to do this from Python. Uh, there are examples of some of these probabilistic data structures in JavaScript and C Sharp and Java and in the repo as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and run this. So we'll do Python, Python. Uh, we'll say build.py. And this is going to start reading that CSV file. And it's, now it's adding to the balloon filter, or to the, uh, the heavy keeper, the top K. Over here, I'm not going to turn my Bluetooth off. We'll do Python app.py, and that is listening on port 5000. So if we go out to Redis Insights here, go to the keys, and refresh it. Let me embiggen this a little bit. Close the CLI here. We see that we've got, uh, there's my bloom filter from earlier. Here's the UFO words and UFO shapes. If I go over here and I can do a command, I can see like, uh, 
uh, top k dot list UFO shapes, and then it spits out what are currently the top k top ten UFO shapes: light, circle, triangle, disk, sphere, other unknown formation, oval, and fireball. Those are all shapes, I, I believe, right? Um, and I've got a little website here that is, let me refresh it. Oh, come on. <laughs> 127.0.0.1. This totally worked the last time I did it. Okay. We'll use Firefox. No, just run Firefox, damn it. <laughs> I literally rehearsed this right before I came here. Skip this step. I, no, no, I skip this step. This is an exciting demo, isn't it? <laughs> Just let me browse, damn it. <laughs> okay, 127.0.0.1. There we go. So I got a little web app. It's just pulling that server, and it's going out and, and uh, getting the, the latest count every second. So, stupid, useless, and fun. That's, what, that's how my wife describes me. <laughs> so, let's go ahead and get back to the slides there. So, this part of this is just to show this stuff is real. That's really why I tend to do the demos. Um, if you want to check out some of these resources, uh, all this stuff's out in the GitHub repository. Uh, there's a Bloom Filters by Example uh, blog post that was fantastic, helped me understand them. Uh, and the little calculators out there as well. There's a MinHash tutorial, which is uh, honestly the bulk of where I, I learned how MinHash has worked. Uh, he did a great job. Uh, Heavy Keeper, there's a white paper out there. I translated that into code and slides so that you don't have to. Uh, the UFO data, sightings, data set sightings data sets out there. Uh, the new fork.org is a real website. Um, I didn't make it up. I don't have the patience to type in 112,092 UFO sightings. Uh, we got a blog post on, on Redis.com uh, by my coworker Ariel, uh, who wrote the uh, actually wrote the data structure for Top K. Uh, and then uh, Redis Bloom is at RedisBloom.io, and you can get uh, Redis Insight at Redis.com/RedisInsight. Um, if you haven't figured it out yet, I work for Redis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, we've got a Discord server, so if you have Redis questions, you can hit us up on discord.gg slash Redis. Usually I'll be the person answering the question, but there are others. Uh, and uh, there's about, I think we got about five or 6,000 people on the Discord server already, so uh, it's pretty active. Uh, free classes on Redis at university.redis.com. And you can sign up for a cloud version of Redis that has all these probabilistic data structures baked in at redis.com slash try free. And if you use code stack200, my boss will know that you saw my talk. Uh, for those who uh, didn't get and want to get all the code and slides, there's a QR code. It will never give you up. It will never let you down. <laughs> and that's pretty much what I've got. I, I, try, I always try to leave it up there for a bit for everyone to grab the picture, and so I'm stalling. 